This podcast is produced by Visionary Studios. Hey everyone, I'm Mitchell Rail. And I'm Wade Clausen. And welcome back to Let's Unpack That. Today we are joined by Josh Menser. Josh, welcome to the pod. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me. This is my first podcast, so I'm excited. Thank of you. Of course. I see. Hey, podcasting era. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go. So Josh, tell everyone who may not know who you are already a little bit about yourself. Give us a background. Who is Josh? So I grew up in Eastern Iowa, Cedar Rapids. So I graduated high school there, um, graduated college from Iowa State. I got involved in some research, but actually I spent my first year of college out in California. After graduating from Iowa State, I moved to Minneapolis for a year. I worked in like a startup like kind of research by renewable lab. I got into Minnesota. I got into cancer research during there, uh, PhD work. And I switched to my PharmD just this year, which made me move to the Chicago area. Kind of here I am. Uh, we can kind of get through any more of that yeah. as we need. No, you have <laughs> so much, so much ground that you cover. It's like so <laughs> impressive. But let's start in Iowa. What was it like for you growing up? Obviously, Iowa tends to be a more conservative area. What was it like growing up there and kind of coming into yourself as a gay individual? I, mean, I really didn't have any, like, a need for that part of me to kind of really show mm-hmm. for a while um, until I got, a, got to college. Like it just wasn't part of my identity until around then like that I questioned it. I mean, part of it also, I mean, when you grow up in the like con- con- conservative areas, a lot of it about yourself, you kind of have to suppress and mm-hmm. hold that down. Part of that comes with suppressing you know, a lot of your emotions and things like, oh, what do I want? Like, what do I, what do I actually think about? You know, and that's, um, I think, kind of how I did it. I just, you know, if you don't pretend it's there, then it's not there. Mm-hmm. So, and I, until you actually start exploring that area, you don't really have to unpack that. Mm-hmm. Until then. <laughs> <laughs> so, when did you really feel comfortable to like really open up and come out? Um, I didn't really have a, like an official coming out. Like I said, I just kind of started hanging around guys, and well, I had mostly straight friends in, back in Iowa. So I moved to Minneapolis. I started hanging out more with the gay area, mm-hmm. and you know, I think being in a city like that was a little more acceptable. I think I felt more comfortable too, mm-hmm. kind of having that. Um, exploration too. Actually, my very first time at a gay bar. Uh, my friend Thomas, uh, God, he's a great, great guy. One of my best friends. I was underage, and I go to the main gay bar there. And it was not even 30 seconds. I was up to the bar, and he comes up to me, and he's like, "You're not from here." Uh, I was like, "What do you mean?" And I, my, I was like, in my head, I'm like, I told people that I'm gay. I just got exploring what's going on. This person comes up, doesn't know I'm in town in a big city like this. So I was like, I don't know what's happening right now. <laughs> he's like. I know every pretty person in this town. I don't know who you are. Who are you? <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. And I, he kind of saw, I was like new and kind of figuring things out. So he kind of took him under his wing and said, they cut, they're the ones who kind of showed me how, like all the parties mm. and that kind of introduced me to some of the people. So then being in Minneapolis, it was very easy for me to explore that when I was there. So there was no like official moment. It was just sort of like a, oh, this is a new part about me that yeah. I think I'm going to enjoy. A natural, a natural. Just naturally, any, yeah. other, any other exploration part of your identity. Yeah. I mean, it was a big one, yeah. obviously, but um, there wasn't a big moment that I considered this was my coming out yeah. day. Yeah, Same, I can feel that as well. Once you moved to Minneapolis, is that really, would you say you came into more of yourself as a gay um, person? And I'd say the end of my college year. And what did you major in? So I majored in genetics. I like studying down the molecular things like why, like why, like why does this protein act in a certain way? And usually it can be explained down, oh, well, and it's code, it's coded down to this whatever. And there's some other stuff that can go into that. I'm kind of a nerd. You're going to learn I'm, I'm, I'm a nerd first, <laughs> first and foremost, and people don't really expect that from me. Yeah. But I, I said, I will talk about my research all day and work. It's so careful. That <laughs> <laughs> is a Pandora's box you're opening, and it is a very difficult box to keep shut once you get me going. So, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, how about this? Give us a brief overview. You, of the kind of work you have done research-wise. I know you did yeah. I know you've done stuff both in Minneapolis, right? And then also in your time in California, you did some research. So do you yeah. want to give us kind of a broad strokes overview yeah. on what that was like and kind of the work you did? So one of my first research labs was uh, this endocr- like this, um, marine endocrinology lab. I was just a freshman trying to get into some research, trying to figure out what I like about the sciences. And like, so they were doing genetic testing on some of these fish and trying to figure out some of their like genotype, like essentially like the sex that they were born in, born with, because the certain type of fish that's super native to this bay on California was like 97% female. And so my, this grad student was working on this research project trying to figure out what's going on. And we found out a lot of these were actually pretty big born male, but they're turning into females. And so we were able to like trying to prove that there was this estrogen in that coming off of like this plant or like something similar, like a pro-estrogen thing that was kind of changing all of these fish to whatever. And so all in all, we were able to get like presented to the state government, the state of California. And that's like a really cool thing, a really cool experience to kind of do as like 19 years old. I mean, I was going, I was, you know, blacking out at a cornfield, like how many months before that? And suddenly they, should, they were trusting me to do this. <laughs> so would you say that that's one of the most like 
impactful. Like, so I think that was one of the moments I really truly felt like a love of science. Um, I work in Minneapolis. Uh, I did some oncology research. I did pharmacogenomics. So what is that? So pharmacogenomics is using genomics and genetics in the world of pharmacology and pharmaceutics and even like medicine. We were able to use like certain genetic researchers in certain cancer cell labs to correlate within humans, like actual cancer cells. And we can essentially, you know, you have you test cancer cells in the lab, kind of figure okay. out how to touch it in humans. And so I actually was in an area that we could do that with our computer based on the gen like genetic stuff, like the 10,000 genes and like how there's certain profiles and stuff. So there's a whole lot of math and stat stuff that I tell you I'm not, I don't need to go into. <laughs> but um, that to kind of give a summary, uh, it's really cool that I actually found a drug that is actually in animal testing right now. It was an old drug. Um, I can't do too much because I signed a lot of paperwork in my area of uh, prostate cancer research. Um, and it's in animal testing right now. And it's showing a, like a lot of great promise. I just actually just got some preliminary results back from some like, animal testing labs. And then the numbers are exactly the total totally they would be and so I'm really excited there because I can go to the clinical trials like years, so years cool. down the road which is like at 20 some years old saying mm -hmm. like hey I could do that it's great it doesn't really help me out now because it takes forever to get that whole process done and especially like I talk about it and I'm like oh I'm doing all this fun stuff and people ask me about it and I'm like well it's still doing this and they're like it's been a while I was like yeah I know I'm very aware <laughs> <laughs> but um that's a brief summary of some of my research work yeah. area. I think um, that's like so cool and like to have like such a purpose driven like field that you're part of and really making an impact in the world. I think especially for people that are likely listening to this, I think they also people probably think of you as like, oh Josh just like he posts some shirtless pictures on Twitter. <laughs> but like you're you have like a you have a brain in between your two ears that like is really being put to so much important work and and, and use. Bravo to you oh. for like everything you do because I couldn't. I I don't know how to like <laughs> Do oh. anything like science or math related. Like my major in college, I did public relations instead of marketing because marketing required more math courses and I <laughs> couldn't do it. Do you have any advice for people going into either the bio field or the medical field on trying to find their niche? It's fine if you don't know. People bounce around all the time. And especially today, like if you find an area that you love, don't get so tunnel visioned. If you, have, if you find, have a goal, great. But realize that things change. The world changes, especially in the world of science. Mm -hmm. You know, your job might not be here in a few years from now. The film company might put something out and wipe out an entire drug from the market. If you don't know your niche and you're trying to find it, that's fine. You will find something you like. And if you work on that project for a while and your things change, then change it. You know, you know no one's going to force you to do something nice and doing what you want to do. And yeah. life is way too short. On the topic of health, especially in the gay community, it's so important to know your status and get tested. Yes. But I think for those who maybe are entering into the community or just trying to get their bearings, it can be kind of hard to get a, a understanding of like, what does that mean? Why is it important? Where do I go? What do I do? Could you kind of give a little breakdown or overview on the importance of getting yeah. tested and kind of what, what is out there for people? I guess I have two, th two main things with that. First, uh, for the, especially the, the younger ones or like maybe who are newer to the gay communities, um, if you can get on PrEP, whether that be like Truvada or Descovy, get on it. Obviously, listen to your medical providers, but like those medications have been doing incredible things for the community. Like I said, it just takes one. And there's like some real shady people in this world. So you just have to protect yourself first. Also from that, you is you. Uh, undetectable is untransmittable. You know, that has been scientifically proven. We know that. Uh, but still... It's always good to protect from both ends. And the second thing off of that is one thing that I've found that many people don't understand is the time it takes for a positive STI test to come back. If you have, if you have your party on Saturday night and you go out, you go home with someone and they give you something, your Tuesday or even Wednesday, like STI screening is not going to show that up. Like it's going to take a few times. It's going to take a while for that to come up. Like if there's a reason they ask when you're on your, when you go to your STI checkup, your last um, hookup is, is because if it's within a certain amount of days, that's, you have to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people don't know that. So they, they'll, they'll like, so for example, if you want to go to Steamworks, don't do it right around your, like, don't like wait, at least don't do it within a week. If you're like ST, regular STI screening, yeah. cause anything that you, like, if you're going to have any, but do it like close enough, like keeping track, so that you're close enough so that if you know, you're, yeah. you're already ready. Yeah. You know, things like it's, it's understanding things like that, that I think if someone just told me like, you're going to have to calendar that out, like structure it this way, do things like that. I think would have been nice. So if I, words of advice, understand the time it takes for positive STI screening to come back, as well as um, know your status. And if you can get on sort of prep, great. And also know that there's um, post exposure too. Mm -hmm. Within 48 hours, you can also take, if you're not on it and you think you've been exposed for within 40 hours, you can get to, a, get to a pharmacy, get to a provider, they can help you out with that. Yeah. Um, I guess that's two words of advice. 
Just, no, that's good advice. That's good to know your status and be um, not risking it. Okay, so you have a platform on Twitter. When did you start using Twitter as like a place for thirst traps and like start objectifying yourself and kind of gaining a following for that? Oh, within the last like two years. Would you say that that following and having an active presence on that platform has kind of helped you meet people across the country? Oh yes, I've met so many people from being online. Um, and I think that's great, especially as someone who was in school and working all the time. Like when I go out, it's like, I'm penciling it into scheduling to go out because that's my time to do it and I have time to see my friends mm -hmm. when, I go, when I do go out. So um, it's been, being online has been nice to connect with people and interact throughout the day. And you know, if I put down a random thought, it takes me five seconds to post it on there. Like I said, I, I just post some random thoughts and people seem to like it. Um, and then I come back to it a couple hours later and if there's some interactions with it, and I'm like, oh great. And I maybe can see, only have time to see a few of them. I wish I try to get back to everybody as I can and I'm so horrible at it. Uh, but I do try to get back to people. I do, I promise. I just don't, I can't have everyone's notifications on in my inbox. Otherwise your phone would just be like my, exploding. Like, oh, I turned, <laughs> I, I turned off notifications from my actual on my phone. But like when I turn on my actual like notification center on my, like on my app, it's, it's too much if it's everybody's notification. So I have to set it to a certain amount of people. Yeah. Um, so I can't see everybody's. I try to do my best, but I promise I love everybody out there that does. <laughs> and I, he I do. loves all the little Joshies I, I out there. Joshies. Yeah. <laughs> Objectification, something that's mm -hmm. really big in like the Twitter world. For you, how have you kind of navigated and processed that mentally of being viewed as an object? So often only viewed as you know, your body versus like you as a person, your personality or like your, your passion is. And that's always something that a lot of people, like a lot of gays have to deal with, especially with how yeah, superficial, how much the gays value looks and appearance. It's, it's, it's very obvious. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very obvious. Like also like, there's like some, some of the racism in there too. Like, and we know, like I, 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 we see it and we always point it out and nothing, you know, you, you do your part and, and nothing seems to have really happen of it. Um, but people get, you know, people get called out on Twitter all the time for it. People are going to objectify you. And I've learned that when I walk in, people are going to do it whether you like it or not. Yeah. And part of that, realizing that once it's out of my control, like I can't control that they're going to objectify me. But I also have met some of the like, best people and one of my best friends in my life that I've known for years through mm -hmm. hooking up with them first. Mm -hmm. And... Maybe it may have been one hookup. It may have been multiple. It may have been, I may still hook up with them occasionally. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just here. It's, but that doesn't mean I value them any less. We've, as gays, I think we've been able to establish that difference of the, like the emotional versus the physical. Some people have it, some people can't. Some people don't, can't separate that. Mm -hmm. And that's totally fine. You know, it, it's all up to you and how you decide to do that. I think that's really interesting to like hear how it, like it's different. Like everyone has their own thing and it's oh, yeah, cool yeah. for everyone to do their own thing. But I would love to hear like, how has it made you feel? In your experiences at first, was it like, oh, this is totally cool just going with the flow and you've just kind of just like gone with it? Or has it been hard, especially as you're with these people that you're building a friendship with and then you're also maybe hooking up with them on and off? How do you like be like, oh, friend and then also like, we can, we're all just like friends with benefits. Like, I mean, just like with any relationship, you have boundaries. Yeah. So you understand what those boundaries are with each individuals, mm -hmm. you know, and you're, how did you get to that place? Were you always like that or did it take time for you to get there? Um, it took time, obviously it took time to get there just as a regular adjustment period to like take the gay culture and understanding mm -hmm. that aspect of like how open the sex is and like the concept of open relationships mm -hmm. and like how that works. And like, it did take some exploration and it did, did take some adjustment, mm -hmm. you know? Um, Luckily, I had a great, I had a great boyfriend who helped me go through, uh, help discover some of that as well, mm -hmm. and we worked through a lot of that stuff together. X, boyfriend, but we're, we're, we're still, <laughs> I'm single. <laughs> we're still, we're still great. <laughs> I was also had some good friends that kind of who had very successful relationships doing so, mm -hmm. and could sh um, show me and, and kind of explain, and I could see how easy it was to just the world is willing to get your own. You know, these rules that society tell you exist, you can follow them. They're probably there for a reason, mm -hmm. but you know if you are happy like again a throuple or if you are happy having an open relationship or if you are happy being in a monogamous mm -hmm. that's what's going to make you happy yeah and in the end people are going to you're going to whatever you do is going to piss someone off yeah no matter what you do someone somewhere is going to be upset with it for whatever reason yeah but like you said just life's too short and as long as you aren't hurting the people you care about yeah if it makes you happy that's what you should do. Yeah, I think people like they hear like, oh, someone's in an open relationship or they're in a throuple or they're with, they have all these friends and they're hooking up with them too. I think people like 
struggle to really understand like how you make that work in your mind. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think I think it's important to like hear how that works for other people so they can gain an understanding of what that's Mm -hmm. like and at least have a respect for it, even if it isn't for them. So I guess I really would love to just like hear from you, like when you are doing this with your friends and you're, you know, having, it does seem to work for you. Like you're in a, you Mm -hmm. have a very busy life. Don't necessarily have that time for a relationship. So being able to have like these more casual interactions with people that do, you do have a connection with personally, makes it like, worthwhile for you to keep doing that because it just works it's what Mm -hmm. it's what's working for you how did you get to realizing that that is what worked for you like what what kind of made you realize that and kind of really realize that oh this is what i enjoy we as humans are so so addicted to the concept of forever and eternity Mm -hmm. you know we were like we get so upset with the thought of loss Mm -hmm. you know we get so nervous at the thought of like this is temporary but like that's life life is not life isn't temporary and so when someone you meet in person is so like you connect and it's great, you know, just because you know, and you know, like in a while, like that's probably why you date right off the bat. Mm-hmm. Same reason you're dating off the bat instead of like to kind of learn what you like, learn what you need. And you understand the person not can be around forever, but in that moment, like doesn't mean they can't be a great lover. doesn't mean you guys can't connect in the way that yours are great. If there's something stopping you, like pre-established rules or relationships, mm-hmm. obviously don't. But like if you know if you're single and you connect with someone like if there's three friends we, I connect with, like physically that I would never date. And we know that. <laughs> <laughs> we know that. But like, there's certain things we connect on, but we only do in small doses. And mm-hmm. but why would I deny myself that part of my life if nothing's stopping me from enjoying that part of life? We're mm-hmm. both there. Mm-hmm. We're both for like why wouldn't I? Yeah. Um. And so, but. For people who see that and don't understand that, like that's not for me. Mm-hmm. Like part of this place is realizing that great, it's not for you. Yeah. But look at how happy they are. Like for them in their life, that's making them happy right now. Mm-hmm. And you have no space to stop in there and say, that's wrong. Because the same reason they wouldn't look at you and say, your relationship's wrong. Mm-hmm. Because for them, they realize that that works for them and your sync monogamy relationship works for you. It's not your relationship. Mm-hmm. And you can sit there and yabber into the void all you want, but I guarantee you those people do, or those people do not care yeah. about your opinion on their sex life. Yeah. yeah. And I think, I think a lot of people, especially the older generation, they really get, get uh, like so like wrapped up in it and are so like upset because they don't understand. And they more times than not, they don't want to understand. They just want to have these one-liner jokes and jabs and jokes and they're so funny because they don't understand it and a lot of times I really feel like they really have no interest in trying to understand things that are different than oh if you're not if you aren't straight or if you aren't like in a relationship with somebody then I don't get it or if you aren't a guy or a girl then I don't understand who you I don't understand you Mm -hmm. if you aren't fitting into these boxes that are somewhat accepted in society then I don't even want to try to understand. I just want to make fun of you, degrade you, bully you. Oh yeah, like that's what our that's what our society, especially in, especially in the political spectrum. I feel like that's what it's be- yeah, what it's becoming. Oh yeah, and realize that like I said, it's out of your that's out of your control. If there's people who are choosing to believe something, that if they are ignoring what's in front of them, then like they and choosing to believe something, realize that that's a like that's a reflection on them. Mm-hmm. Realize if they are calling you words about this, or if they say I like. I don't understand you or you don't live the way I think you should live. And so you are subhuman to me. You know, they realize that you can't do anything about that. Mm-hmm. And that there are things this is in life that are out of your control and that's out of your control. And there are times that you just got to protect yourself. And if you say, just don't interact because like, and if they come at you, if they come at you for saying whatever, like some, most of the time when I talk about people on Twitter politically, um, I, I'm doing it for my own enjoyment. Is there any other just closing advice that you would give maybe a younger gay individual or a younger version of yourself? Seen with many gays, especially those come from small towns, you know, you don't get some of the exposure to certain set of circumstances that some straight people do. So they have time to develop these relationships. They have time to process these as a normal person does during that normal time when it's supposed to be processed. But some of these aspects of, like I've mentioned, you know, if you ways you connect with a community, if you don't do that till you're like an adult, you're going to have a lot of these processing that you have to do right off the bat that you have to do in a short amount of time. The most, most people, most normal, you know, like straight people can do over, sorry, over the course of like a normal period of time. So it's okay if it feels a lot, a lot. It's okay if, it, if you don't understand what's going on because you've not been exposed to a situation that you're supposed to know what's going on. 
So it's okay to to have to figure that out and take time to figure that out. It's okay to not know. It's okay to have to figure it out because most people are are faking it. Well, thank you so much, Josh. Uh, Mm -hmm. Do you want to give everyone your socials so they can follow you if they aren't already? Yeah, so obviously Twitter, uh, Joshi Malashi. That's J-O-S-H-I-E. M-O-L-O-S-H-I-E. You guys can uh, check us out on Instagram at UnpackTHT and on TikTok at UnpackThatPod. We'll see you guys next Thursday. Bye, everyone. Bye.